Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? We just reset the mic. Am I too loud? All right, good. Thank you. Well, welcome back. We took a two month break from doing these over the summer, but now that the university is back in full swing, as you see, we have students across the campus today and did last week. We're going to get back to doing these on a monthly basis, at least as long as people show up for them to show that you have an interest and we'll tailor it based on your needs over time. As always, I do want to start by recognizing our faculty members and staff members who, who have achieved external grants to support what they're doing at the university. And this is a big list, so I'm going to do something I don't normally do, and that is cheat by looking at a, at a cue card for that. Because in June, we had 12 faculty who were awarded grants. Uh, for those of you who are on the list, Nona Ho has always sent something out to recognize them for the work that they're doing. So Dr. Hupp, Dr. Safadi, Dr. Poultry, Dr. Shin, Dr. Sivik, Dr. Oyewomi, Dr. Kirchner, Dr. Kazimov, Dr. Winters, Dr. Berenger, Dr. Yin, Dr. Dong, Dr. Chilean, and Dr. Ohanian. And I do want to note the, the big ones. So Dr. Yin received $100,000 from the American Heart Association for this year. And the team of Dr. Dong, uh, Chilean, and Ohanian, $2.3 million from the NIH for a four-year period of time. So amazing work by them. And we're really excited to have them on the team. And I want to thank them for all that they do. Uh, for us, the research that they do, and the partnerships that they help create to make this possible. I also want to recognize one of our students, and you've heard the name many times because this is somebody whose name you need to keep an eye on. They're going to do great things when they graduate this university because they're already doing great things. And, and that is uh, Sanjay Jinka. Sanjay is the CEO of the SOAR Clinic. He's a fourth-year medical student. He's a student trustee for our board of trustees, and he was just awarded a $10,000 scholarship by the American Medical Association Foundation uh, for Ohio Future Physician. So this is an amazing award and great recognition for him and by association of the university. I also wanna thank Dr. Safadi and his entire team of students for running the Neovations program. That's our bench to bedside program. For those of you who were able to attend last week, we had 19 teams presenting new technologies that they created to address real world medical problems, working in interdisciplinary teams. Uh, and at this year's event, we awarded $19,000 in milestone funding. We're looking to continue to grow that. The new leadership team coming in place is expecting to expand it to 40 teams this year, which would be really quite large. And we had visitors from across the entire region and we had visitors come join us from across the United States uh, to observe the event, to do judging. And we heard nothing but wonderful things about what a great program that is. As I mentioned, we have new students on campus. Last week uh, was the kickoff for the first year medical students. We have 174 new medical students starting their first year studies. That's our largest class ever. Um, and then we have 72 currently enrolled for the College of Pharmacy who will be joining us soon. The graduate school is growing. And in fact, we have a new program that's an offshoot from the IPM program. It's an innovation program, which marries in really well with the Neovations program Dr. Safari is running. Um, I've been told we already have 15 applicants for this brand new master's degree, which is great. Uh, we, with new programming, you tend to start small and have to build it over time. So we're really looking forward to the growth of the College of Graduate Studies. Uh, Dr. Jim Ketzenheimer has joined our faculty. He is a bioengineer who was teaching medical device design at the University of Akron, really experienced, collaborative individual, so I'm excited to have him join our team. We had a white coat ceremony on Friday, which was an amazing event to see all the friends and family of our students, the excitement to, to become new professionals in the field of healthcare. Uh, that event was really quite amazing, and it's just the beginning. So that, that's really the launching point. 
for becoming a doctor for them. And our next stage, we hope to get them all across in the next four years will be when we have a chance to honor them at commencement. So this is why we're here. I mean, we do other things, certainly research and service are really important, but as a university, bringing in new students, helping to build them and to grow them into talented professionals, to get them across the stage and to get them out and serving the community. And uh, given uh, our age, or at least my age, these are the people who are eventually going to be taking care of us. So we want to make sure we have really good, high quality graduates coming out of this university. And we, we always do. We've been working hard on building and strengthening our clinical partnerships. We have been partnered for years, in fact, for the life of the university with many of them, and we are growing new ones. But we can't do this alone. Near, nearly every program we have in education and many of the things we do in research require these partnerships. So we're working hard to build and strengthen and unify those partnerships. SUMA Healthcare has been a big partner of ours since the beginning. They are putting, they put together a new leadership team. Uh, it's, a, it's a team of individuals looking at research and education and innovation and how we work together, including faculty and student development. We've been meeting now routinely for the last two years, and this is, this is continuing to build new programming and strengthen our relationship with them. Akron Children's Hospital has been a lifelong partner for this university also. Uh, they are continuing looking for ways to strengthen what we do together. Their new CEO, Chris Gessner, and their new Chief Academic Officer is Michael Forbes. They are really looking to grow this in a substantial new way, especially around research and faculty development. So those meetings are ongoing. We're excited for those possibilities. We had a visit to our campus last week from John Llewellyn, who is the president of Mercy Youngstown and St. Eve's and the, the group that's here as part of Bon Secours in Northeast Ohio. Uh, they're continuing to be committed to us, looking at growing the partnership. They're really more focused on education looking to train our students and to have them stay and serve in the region. Uh, but he came out for a visit to our campus for the first time and was incredibly impressed that our facilities and the people that he met. And as many of you are, I hope all of you are aware, we've got a brand new partnership with university hospitals. And that's a big partnership that will also evolve around um, meetings from our leadership and our faculty and our staff who've been put on the joint strategic oversight groups. Uh, and those groups are also around education, research, leadership and faculty development, innovation, and then a structural group on how we can do more together. One of the key pieces for us is we will now have 26 third year medical students in every one of the clerkship rotations who will rotate at university hospitals. And that includes um, having some students at Rainbow Babies, and very, very importantly, at the Cleveland Medical Center, which is their flagship institution. And they are a well-funded um, research enterprise. They have nearly $200 million a year in federal grants, um, about half of that from NIH. They're really interested in working with the students, partnering with our faculty. So we are truly serving Northeast Ohio as intended, so that we're working in Akron, we're working in Canton with Altman, We'll be growing a bigger footprint with Mercy Cleveland Clinic in Canton also. They are already training our CAA students. They participate a little bit in the education of medical students at Altman. And then, of course, we are also in Youngstown. And now we are really in Cleveland. And Metro Health is looking to do more with us also. So this is a great opportunity for us. It's really important that we build these bridges and these bonds. And this new UH partnership will be uh, really quite powerful for us. We are undergoing our Higher Learning Commission uh, reaccreditation in September, although all the work started over a year ago. I do want to thank Dr. Jeff Winstrip, who is chairing the committee for this, uh, Deb Loyette, who's really the glue holding all this together, and Rick Kasmer for their leadership on this. But I also know that everybody in this room, or many of you in this room, has, has played a significant role this is a university-wide um, approach 
to HLC. We need it to be that way because it's an assessment of the entire university. They will look at individual colleges. They will look at student services. They will look at the research enterprise. They will look at funding and budgeting. There's nothing we do that they don't have the right to take a look at. This happens every decade. This is our biggest accreditation. Uh, we need to have this to exist as a university. Under it really would be the ACPE for pharmacy, LCME for medicine, ARCAA for the CAA program. Um, if we were having problems with those, it, it would affect only those programs. This affects the entire university. The leadership team has brought everyone together, has really unified us and created a document that I think everybody at this university should read. You'd be amazed. It brings together in about 40 pages everything we do. It has links that many of you may not know exist. So we want to get this out for people to look at where you can find information you may not know we've ever had. I thought it was really eye-opening when I read our argument, as, as the term we use. It's the argument for our self-study. The um, argument was sent to an external reviewer who's done these inspections many times. If, and we asked him to beat it up really hard and tell us why we're doing a bad job. We, we didn't want to hear the sunshine. We know we can see what we're doing well, but please beat this up. And he came back and said, there are some things in the argument you can fix, gave us some recommendations, but he's telling me the same thing that Dr. Kasmer has been telling me is that he thinks we're going to be just fine on this, that we're doing a great job as a university. Nobody ever scores 100%. It just doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, we are not, we're not looking to have any major problems. So I want to thank all of you for that because everything that you do, everything represented in this room, somehow you play a role. One of the things we did learn from it is a student survey that was required by HLC, like many of the accreditation bodies. We had a 48% survey response rate, I'm told. I got that number wrong earlier. And what we heard from the students where they had some concerns about some things, but overall their biggest recognition, all the accolades went to the quality of faculty and staff who were here to support them. That was throughout the survey. So thank, thank all of you for that because the students are recognizing you and your capabilities. Their bigger concerns were on organization of some curriculum, one, one student was making the comment that we need to have more food um, variety and hours of offer availability. We're looking at that. Mary's team is all over that right now. COVID continues to rear its ugly head. Uh, so we've been in a really good spot and we're still okay. But I had a COVID reporting meeting this morning. At that time, we reported last week, we had 10 cases, eight with faculty and staff, two with students. I did learn of a new case with a staff member this morning. Portage County is in the yellow with the new coding system. Uh, Mahoney County and some of the surrounding counties are orange. If we go to orange here, and that's uh, a possibility for sure, we're going to go back to mandatory masking in the academic spaces. You're always encouraged to wear masks in the rest of the campus if you wish to. We're continuing to push vaccines and making sure that you stay updated with your vaccines. Uh, we've been hearing that the Omicron update hopefully will be coming out uh, late September, early October. So those things continue to help us try and stay safe, uh, but it, we're not done. So we're watching and we're hoping not to get back to last January where we really had to shut things down pretty dramatically. Uh, we're following CDC and state guidelines. We have an entire team of people who are monitoring this very closely. And of course, nobody's really paying as much attention yet, but um, monkeypox is something we're watching. The World Health Organization did just announce that they put it at its highest level of alert. There are only three things at that level of alert right now. It's COVID, uh, it's monkeypox, and it's polio. And there was a case of polio in the United States last week, which is the first one in 10 years. So we always have to be vigilant and be prepared to pivot if we need to. Uh, for now, no changes, uh, but we've got a great team who's monitoring this. I just wanted to give you an update. The budget for 2023 was completed. Thank, I want to thank all of you who helped us with that. It's a huge amount of work. 
But I, and I know there's a team, a uh, whole village who makes this budget happen, but Marilyn Ward, Jackie Kovac, and, and Mary Taylor really did the uh, yeoman's work on this. It's, this is a big pull. Going to zero-based budgeting was a big effort. I think everybody felt comfortable with it this year. It wasn't quite the difficult process as people were learning it last year, but ultimately the results were very, very good for us. For this coming year, uh, to give you some highlights, the Board of Trustees has approved our budget that we submitted to them in our June meeting. We were able to put an additional $3.4 million, a little more than $3.4 million into the budget. So money went up. It wasn't money in tight times with inflation where we had to crunch and take money and resources away from people. $3.4 million new dollars went into the budget to support what you do. We also authorized 14 new higher positions. Um, many of those were around uh, areas that have been undersupported on the campus, uh, including registrar's office and the folks who um, handle student services. These things are really important because this university grew without growing that foundation. And now we're continuing to grow. So we have to make sure that foundation is supported appropriately. In addition to that, we um, put in about one point, I'm going to say about 1.4 to 1.6 million dollars to increase salaries uh, for compensation for our employees. We went with a system that allowed us to uh, do a base increase, to do a performance-based increase, and then for staff to also do a separate incentive increase. So that means with the new PFS system that goes from one to five and one and two are considered um, below uh, expectation performances, that above a one and two, there was an incremental increase that could get up to as much as four, four plus percent. We also had an increase in our uh, number of faculty who went for the new opt-in um, performance pay plan. The average faculty member went up pretty dramatically as we work. They were the most, uh, I think, most underpaid relative to market, and that's a national market. When I first arrived uh, during our our first pilot year, uh, we had about I think, I think we had 23 in total who were in it. 17 opt-in plus some new hires. The average salary for them went up by 12 percent, and that was just to get them in line with where they should have been relative to the rest of the country. And that's with even adjusting for the fact that cost of living here is not the same as cost of living in San Francisco. So that's a full expansion this year. We decided to do one more pilot year. We want faculty to feel very comfortable with it. So that after this year, if you stay in, you're in. Um, if you're out of it, you can always opt in any year after the pilot year, but then once you're in, you're in. We don't want people back and forth to it would, it's meant to be a system that really recognizes and rewards faculty, but we don't want people playing, playing, playing the system either. So that's gone very well. And then we worked really hard with our consultants to get staff appropriately classified to ensure that our compensation benchmarks were meeting those in our regional areas so that we're competitive. And we were, I would say, 95% of the way there um, as of the beginning of this budget season that we just finished. But during the new budget process, we did authorize 22 reclassifications. So that's more than 10% of our staff, probably closer to 18% of our staff were allowed to be reclassified because their job wasn't necessarily as described. And those, of course, come with some level of pay increases. So we're working really hard to try and make sure that you're taken care of for all the work that you do. We couldn't run this university without you, obviously. Right? You make everything happen, our faculty and our staff. So those are the highlights of the budget process. Um, the budget was presented to the Board of Trustees. They were very comfortable with it. There was nothing in that process that raised any red flags for them whatsoever. In fact, they gave Mary's team accolades for doing such a great job. And she and her team are continuing to save the university money. We've got a uh, plan for resubmitting some of our current bonds. Basically what you do with your home when you find a better interest rate, uh, we're doing the same thing. And it looks like, I mean, today we've had over 600,000 in savings annually 
not once annually from doing that to our budgets uh, to, with, I'm sorry, with our current bonds. And we have one that's due now that looks like we'll probably be able, if the market stays in good condition, we'll probably save another $100,000 per year. That's money we were just wasting away and giving to banks. And so now we're bringing it back in and reinvesting it to the university. Those are the highlights of this fiscal year. Uh, last year, we had a SIP funding program it was our strategic initiative funds that Lacey Madison's team was managing. Um, Lacey is our vice president for strategy and transformation. Put this program together. We set a million dollars aside and we spent almost all of it. There was a little bit left that just rolled over and we're gonna have at least a half million this year. And it's to fund the ideas that you submitted that help support our strategic plan and move us forward. Because we know that the executive management team can't just say, let's do these things and we're gonna get there. We need you to be part of it because you are what makes this university run. And we have some great submissions for ideas for things to improve research, to improve translational research, to improve research opportunities for students, to improve education, to improve our partnerships, Anything that has to do with strategic plan could be submitted, and it was, I think, very effective, and we're looking forward to continuing to support these initiatives that are organic from you and helping us to grow the university. Currently, we have a space planning committee, and it may sound like that sounds like a really boring committee to be on, but it's critical to us. It's understanding how we use the space at this university. It was, I think, quite enlightening. We're going to hear a report out on that today, uh, but kind of a back of the napkin would say that we probably only use 30% of our academic space. 30%. That means we have 70% capacity just sitting out there. In fact, it's rare, but this room was broadly available to us for this meeting today. And I think if you looked at the calendar, you'll find that there's likely six out of 10 hours a day that this room is vacant and just sitting empty. So we've, we've got to figure out better ways so that we're not building new buildings and spending money on new buildings and then worrying about the cost of maintaining them when we can revamp the space that we have. I think a key piece for us as we work with that committee and they work with the enroll, strategic enrollment committee is to say, why isn't it being used? Is the technology not adequate? Do we need to tear all of these out and say, we're not doing lecture halls. We need round tables or we need tables like the Great Hall so that we have an opportunity to use this a little bit better. Dale, I think we need our HVAC system in here. This place is getting a little warm. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, since the last time I did an update, Dr. Schmidt is now retired, but he's coming back to help with some programs just part time. But we lost a lot of corporate knowledge with Dr. Schmidt. He'd been affiliated with this university for over 30 years. He was last serving as our vice president for research and our dean of our college graduate studies. He would tell me frequently that it's two full-time jobs. Uh, you need more than one person. And I, I put a lot of stock in what he had to say. So we split this into two separate positions. We're really fortunate to have interims who stood up from this university to fill those gaps and to make sure we're moving forward well and they're doing a great job. So I wanna thank Dr. Rebecca German, who is now our interim vice president for research. She's really hit the ground running. And then uh, Dr. Julie Altman, who's serving as our interim dean for the college graduate studies and she's doing the same. They've been amazing members of the executive management team. As an update on those, we are underway with a search for the VPR. Uh, we had 12 candidates. We've decided to um, initially interview five. Um, we've got some others that are qualified that we're, we're kind of holding in the parking lot. Uh, we're going to start that interview process this week and into next. Uh, we're then going to get, to, these are virtual interviews with a committee of about 14 individuals represented by some uh, administration, but mostly by senior faculty members, junior faculty members, department chairs from clinical and basic science. This is an important position to serve the faculty as well as to ensure the university meets its regulatory requirements. Uh, that's the thing that keeps me and Mary out of jail. Um, we can't break federal law. So it's a really important position for me. And it's one where 
um, our clinical partners care because they want somebody who's going to help unify our research efforts together. Once we've gone through that Zoom interview process, and that'll be pretty rapid, and we get down to a top two or three candidates, we're going to invite them out in a really old school fashion, get them in Watonic Unicorn, and ask all of our faculty and interested staff to come and hear their vision for the position, answer questions, and we want, and then we want to hear from you because we want somebody who's really outstanding and going to meet our needs for growth into the future for research. I'm also um, pleased to tell you the College of Medicine search is uh, just underway. We, we have a committee, uh, we've created the job description, and now Whip Kiefer, who's our search firm for that position, is getting it advertised. And so our goal is to really ensure that we get an outstanding College of Medicine dean. We have an outstanding interim dean in Dr. Eugene Maud, who's really done a great job um, pulling the college together. Uh, dealing with the little crises that pop up, but also really, uh, I think, doing a good job interacting with our faculty and our staff and creating a great relationship with the other colleges and with our clinical partners. We have a new vice president for advancement, Doreen Riley. Uh, she couldn't be here today. She's working from afar, little... Uh, calamity around the white coat ceremony. I think she's sustained a little injury, but she will be, uh, she was in the meetings today. She's going to do a great job for us. If you didn't read about her in Pulse, uh, Doreen has years of experience in advancement. She was last at John Carroll University where she took their endowment from 100 million to 300 million, routinely raising between 18 and $30 million a year cash, not pledges, but cash. So we're expecting big things from her as we grow our advancement team. I do want to thank uh, Lindsay Loftus, who was our interim vice president. Uh, Lindsay loves going out and working with donors. He wanted to be and to remain a senior major gifts officer. Uh, he didn't love doing the administrative part, but he did it for us. So thank you Lindsay, also for that. Holidays. One of the things that the university bylaws um, allows the president's office to do is to grant extra days that don't count against your vacation or sick time during the during the winter holiday season. And um, we'll be it for the president who doesn't give it out, right? Because people are used to it. Now, I could see some years where something catastrophic could happen. Uh, but uh, I'm certainly not attempting to do that. We are not in a catastrophic state. I just wanted to announce what our plan is. So currently, we're going to step down operations, have reduced operations on the campus from the 19th of December through the 2nd of January. Now, you are encouraged to use the 19th through the 23rd as either vacation or comp time if you have it. Um, the the uh, bylaws do not allow me to give you extra days, but we're limited to four. So then that rolls us into um, paid holidays, which are the, I'm sorry, I have to cheat and look at this. Uh, the paid holidays, so it's 19th, 22nd, paid holidays, Friday the 23rd. And then we have another one on the 26th, and then another one on the 2nd. So um, that allows us to build days in between those to be able to offset so that you have a continuous period of time where you don't have to come on campus. Now, there are some individuals, yes, it's warm in here, isn't it? It's, uh, there are individuals who can't do this. Our police officers, campus operations, they may reduce their staffing. So we make it up to them by allowing them to use those days later on. We want to take care of everybody at the university. Uh, but uh, those will be awarded again this year, um, which I know has been routine and announced each year. But someday you're going to get a president here who says, no, I'm against this. So enjoy it. Um, I hope to be here with you for a while. Uh, I did announce a challenge at one of these in the past. Uh, I've, we've not been secretive about it. My, my wife, Sarah, is an anesthesiologist. About a year and a half ago, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And she's doing really well with it. Uh, exercise is one of those things that works well. So we want to make a donation to the university. It's initially a small one of $10,000. Uh, 
uh, towards Parkinson's and the Neurosciences Institute. We'll figure out what that's going to look like exactly. Um, what I what I said was we're going to do the Ohio Half Ironman in Sandusky. That was on Sunday. And if anybody from the university came in and joined us, we'd match up to ten thousand dollars for towards the fee that you paid to be donated. Well, we only had one taker, but we're going to do the whole ten thousand. But I do want to recognize Michael Wright. Michael came out and did the entire half Iron Man. I think he found it to be a lot more work than he thought it was going to be. In fact, I don't see him in the audience today. <laughs> I'm wondering if he's made it, but it was really nice to, to see that Michael was there to support this. Uh, and somebody else was there because I was, I don't know how they recognized me. You look like a mess uh, when you're in the middle of this thing. But on the run, I was, just doing the turnaround point and some young lady on the side said, Dr. Lando, and she waved at me. So maybe we had somebody from the university coming out and cheering for it too. Uh, but I wanna thank Michael. Maybe next year we can get some more people doing this so that we can continue to build up a fund towards Parkinson's research, uh, which is one of our strengths. We have great Parkinson's researchers here. Uh, it's an important disease process and one of the top areas of funding for the National Institutes of Health right now. And then finally, from, oh, I'm sorry, I did forget something. Under the UH partnership, there is a new UH Ventures program that's available to us. It's no cost. On the third, if you want to sign up, Lacey Madison will be getting information out. Uh, it, they're going to have Women Innovation Day. Uh, it's no cost. It's a full day event. And um, it's not just for women, gentlemen. Uh, it's, but it's to hear about women who've overcome the challenges that sometimes gender can create in becoming an innovator and an entrepreneur. I also want to recognize uh, Jordan Sindrich. Jordan has been a, a really dedicated member of this university, and Jordan just finished his black belt in Lean Six Sigma, and we'll be using those to grow programming and to support the work that we're all doing. Thank you, Jordan. all while being a new father. Um, and then finally, uh, and continue to enjoy your summer of wellness. I hope the time on Fridays is meaningful. Uh, use it to do something, whether it's mental health and um, fitness, because it, mental health is a huge problem for all of us, uh, nationwide, worldwide, or physical fitness. Find something to do with that time. Ideally, you're not just getting out early, going home, getting on the couch and eating some bonbons and watching TV. We want you, we want you out doing something to improve your wellness. Uh, doing it together is always better. That way, if it's physical fitness and you're with other people, then you're working on your mental health and your physical health at the same time. Otherwise, I'm going to stop there. I've gone longer than I usually do. There's more to talk about, and we'll try and cram some more of this great information into new updates, and I'll open it up to questions. Anything from our audience here? Sure. Oh. So... So our professionals are telling me, we got to make sure people go to the mics. I'm going to repeat that one, though. So in addition to the Summer of Wellness um, Fridays, where we do two hours, Sequoia every Friday of the summer is allowing anybody and everybody to come for free and to participate in the, um, the gym and the wellness facilities that are here on campus at Sequoia. You don't need to be a member. Anything else from the, the group here? No, it's anything online. Uh, there have been examples where policies have changed and individuals not learn of them until after the fact. Is there a way for policies that have been changed to come out monthly, weekly uh, for continued streamlining of work? Um, this looks like Michelle Mulhern was going to help answer the question. Um, anyway, the answer is yes, we do get them out and communications is our biggest challenge. And it's our challenge because communication requires a sender and a receiver. And we send a lot, but the reception doesn't happen. And 
part of it's because of the way you want to acquire your information. Is it by email? Is it by text through the RAVE system when we do things that way? Those are usually emergencies. Is it by the pulse? Is it through other forms of communication and marketing that the marketing team does under Rod? Um, we've got to figure out a better way to do this because otherwise it's information overload. If we send you an email three times a day with new things, you're going to click delete. Yeah, we know you do. Um, rarely does somebody read it. It's because you're overwhelmed. It's not because, it's not because you don't care. But when you get 100 emails a day, you only have so much bad with. And what we do is we go through and prioritize and you delete things and say, ah, oh, it's important, I'll, I'll, I'll get another one. And you're going to delete that. So we're working hard to try and figure out better ways of giving you information. One of the ways that we think works, uh, it's, it's, it requires you to be active. It's a little more passive on our side is putting critical information up on the TV monitors throughout the university and having it change routinely because we know that many of you walk around to um, get your exercise, to get coffee, to go get lunch, to go between offices. And we're hoping you're looking up and learning a little bit of information. We can continue to send these out and find other avenues. I just don't want to do it and, and not have it actually have any impact because somebody has to do the work to send it out. And if, if they're doing it and nobody's reading it, Jordan's going to come in and say, as a black belt, this is waste. Why are we doing this? Let's not spend our money that way. So we do need to find a better way to do it. Will COVID boosters be available on campus again this year? John, I think the answer is yes. Is that correct? Yes. Up, and we have them up. They're available now. Or? They're available now. And we're giving them out to school up to the new Neomad Healthcare facility up on the second floor. And they are available for you. Any updates regarding a College of Dentistry? So we've been exploring the College of Dentistry because there was a big local need for it. We went through and validated those needs. And the answer is yes, there's a big need. In fact, I was informed that during a state steering committee two weeks ago, the, the attorney who was present for the Ohio Dental Association stated that there was a need for almost 400 dentists because of the shortage right now in the state of Ohio. Um, that was a little bit new to us from the Ohio Dental Association, but that really met the same metrics that we saw from uh, both the federal government and the state government on what the need is just for dentists alone. And that's not even talking about the need for dental hygienists and dental assistants. So we feel like there's a big need there. There's only two colleges in the state that give dental degrees out. One of those is Ohio State. They have a large class. About 80% of their students are from Ohio and they give out a DDS degree. I think it's a great university and they do a great job of it. Uh, then there's uh, Case Western Reserve. They have a smaller college of about 76 students, so a little smaller than half of Ohio State. Um, according to the data they, they submit nationally, they're about 80% out of state or foreign, uh, about 20% within the state. They're, they have a different mission. They're a private school, great school, um, certainly well-recognized name. And uh, that they're, they're fairly expensive. So if you look at their online information, it's like the average student will pay about hundred, close to $100,000 a year in mandatory fees and tuition. Uh, if you look at Ohio State, they're, they're almost half that. Our goal is to do the same, to be focused on Ohio, the whole, you know, the concept of students who are either from Ohio or for Ohio, meaning they're gonna stay here, to practice general dentistry more than specialty so that they're really meeting the unmet needs of the state. Uh, educate them in social determinants of health, get them really focused on the underserved and the Medicaid populations. We've got a great steering committee of um, about 15 individuals who are leaders across the state. They've done a huge amount of work with us. They meet every two weeks and have since December of last year. We've now put together a draft with the assistance of Michelle Mohern of a, a submission to the chancellor's office. And um, I gave an initial presentation to the board of trustees just to, as an FYI, so they're aware of what we're doing. Our hope is that we'll continue to have a plan built out that will result in a 
re requested a review by our board, which is step one in the September meeting. Uh, it's all, a lot of it's predicated on the financials, the pro forma we've created, which is an assessment of what you think it's going to look like, shows that it would do really well with as long as we enroll 50 students as a minimum, and that's would make us the really the smallest in the state of Ohio. Uh, that was built also around the model that we would keep our tuition at, I hate, I'm surprised I'm using the word low, uh, but as low as the tuition is for the College of Medicine, which really for dentists is, is low tuition. It would really put us at the bottom. And the numbers look good. Uh, we've, we've got partners at Mercy Von Spur, at Mercy Cleveland Clinic, SUMA, Akron Children's, Cleveland Dental Institute, and the federally health qualified health centers who are all wanting to step up and train the students. They're committing to it. So I think this is going to happen. Um, we also believe we have a donor uh, who we are really far along with, uh, who would supply a transformational gift. It would be the biggest gift the university has received, and it would be to name a dental college. Uh, we're hoping that within a few weeks, we're going to be able to make an announcement, uh, but we're feeling pretty good about it right now. Would you say, Lindsay? Yeah. Have I said too much on that? Yes. <laughs> transparency, transparency. I've said no names, and it's not a guarantee by any means. Uh, not by me, Preston. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I think, so will salary... With salary raises, we'll be in a consideration to adjusting the educational benefit cutoffs. Not as yet. Uh, we have not decided to do that. Uh, and the reason for that is other input. The, the, now, the folks I tend to hear about from this are the ones who benefit from the educational programs. And the majority of the university does not benefit. benefit right? It's a small subsegment. So there's only a fixed pool of dollars. And if we fund that program, then in general, everybody else gets less benefits and less raises. So we've elected to serve the broader good and to keep the program in place that we have, which has been tailored to help those who are in the lower pay ranges and to take away what we did is we mostly took or reduced the benefits. We didn't take them away. Reduce the benefits for those who are in the high pay ranges who generally can afford tuitions. Um, we're different than most universities too. So when you go to Kent State and Kent State says, we're going to cover your tuition, they don't really give you $8,000. They just let your student come into class and, uh, and it's really, it's transfer costing, right? It doesn't cost them $10,000 to have a student or $8,000 to have a student. But when we offer educational benefits, we actually have to give the full eight or $10,000 to Kent or to Akron so it costs us a lot more money than their programs cost them per person. Even at the reduced rate, we spend more. So for right now, we're gonna keep it where it is. We did elect not to get rid of it. That was the initial thought was, why do we have this? Um, but we heard from you and said, no, 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 leave it alone. So during the pandemic, when it was at its worst, and we had to figure out where we were gonna save money, we, we readjusted it so it mostly impacts those who are in high wage earning categories. Um, you know, if, if you're uh, the dean of a college, I don't think we need to pay you to send your, your child to school. And Dr. Mollett agreed with that, uh, but they, uh, or if he did, he just did. Um, but, but that was the rationale behind it. Um, some programs only serve a few people other programs serve everyone, and it's a fixed pool of money. So if we take away from the group to give to a smaller number of individuals, then um, it, it, it kind of doesn't help the rest of the team. And I know it's important to the smaller group of individuals. I understand that. That's why we maintain as much of it as we could. Is there any consideration to augmenting remote work arrangement to help offset increased costs of gas prices as well as help retain individuals departing to work in remote jobs. We've talked about it. We're at two days right now. Um, most felt that we should stay where we're at. Uh, Andre Burton did mention, he thinks there's a couple of job categories we should look at um, because competitively it's important and because what they do, they really don't need to be here. Um, 
The downside is it's hard to bring somebody onto the team and have them be part of the team if they aren't here. They don't know what we do. They don't interact with us. So let's say, for instance, somebody in, let's make up a name, College of Dentistry Accounting says, look, I just crunch numbers all day. That's all I do. Why do I have to be here? I have uh, a protected remote access site. Well, if you are in a college of dentistry and you need to talk to that person, they don't know you. You haven't interacted with them. So when you put in the call and you're like, I'm uh, number two in charge in the college of dentistry, so I'm going to call and they're going to help me out. They don't know who you are. They're just going to treat you like anybody else would that you're going to pick up the telephone to, and you're probably not going to get that same level of performance. So we're trying to balance this as much as we can. The other complicating factors that I've been made aware of through Mary is that um, according to state law, um, if you work offsite X amount of time, and she, she knows the rules on this, you uh, actually, we have to figure out how to individually do your taxes for the city you live in, as opposed to the taxes for when you work here. And it causes a big explosion for the folks who are doing um, all of the uh, compensation, because now we've got to figure out how 50 different people who live in 50 different townships, what the township rules are, and your taxes may actually be higher uh, because of this through that process. Did you have any comment on that? That's going to be the challenge, not only for our university, but really as an employer, how do we protect the population? Where do you work? She said that that is going to be a high challenge. So, Mary, so if you didn't hear that, Mary just validated that this is a huge challenge. Uh, because by law, we it, we would have to figure out if you worked, say, two days here and three days in your house and your house is in Cuyahoga County, then we've got to figure out how we do taxes for you there three days a week and how we do taxes for you here two days a week. And if we do this for 100 people, this becomes a very complicated issue. So there are a lot of legal issues around this still. Uh, if somebody's 100% at home, which again, it's really hard to have somebody be part of the team and know who know who we are and what we do and how we're unique. If they're 100% away, it still has that challenge where if we have 20 people and they're living in Florida and Hawaii, which is possible, right? Florida, Hawaii, California, simply because they don't want to come in, they just want to work. We have to do taxes for them differently in all these areas. So for now, we felt pretty good about the fact that we have two days that are optional as long as, as long as your supervisor agrees. And that we've got this variability in the day where you can come in late, leave late, you can come in early, um, leave late and take an extended lunch. You can come in early, leave on time and take a slightly extended lunch. I mean, we're really trying to work with you to help, um, help meet your needs. Many people have children and or especially young children they need that assistance. Others find that I need to go take my car and get an oil change. And by the time I get off work, they're closed and um, they're not open on Sundays and I don't really want to use my Saturday. So we try and give you that variability in your calendar to do those types of things. I know it's not necessarily getting to what the person who asked this question wants, I think, uh, but we are doing a pretty good job. We had a discussion about this in EMT when the pandemic looked like it was gone for a while and said, should we go down to one day a week and uniformly everybody in the room said, no, nope, let's keep it at two and let's keep trialing this out and see how it goes. So that that's the, the answer to it. It may not get to what somebody wanted to hear, but it is the answer. And we just received a compensation increase and we're told we would get a bonus the beginning of August where there also be an increase coming with the PFS results. Uh, well, those, those, those are all based on your PFS uh, in, in deep. So the answer is yes. And that looks like it's it for questions. So unless there's any more here in the audience, I want to thank you for your time and look forward to working with you daily, but then getting back to, uh, together in about a month to do this again. Thank you.